Chapter Fifteen of Edison: His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nelly. Edison: His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. Chapter Fifteen. Introduction of the Edison Electric Light. In the previous chapter on the invention of a system, the narrative has been carried along for several years of activity, after the verge of successful and commercial application of Edison's ideas and devices for incandescent electric lighting. The story of any year, one year in this period, if treated chronologically, would branch off in a great many directions. Some going back to early works, others forward to arts not yet within the general survey, and the effect of such treatment will be confusing. In like manner, the development of the Edison lighting system follows several concurrent, simultaneous lines of lines, and an effort was therefore made in the last chapter to give a rapid glance over the whole movement, embracing a term of near five years, and including it in scope. Both the old word and the new. What is necessary to the completeness of the story at this stage is not to recapitulate, but to take up some of the loose ends of the threads, woven in and follow them through, until the clear and comprehensive picture of the events can be seen. Some things it would be difficult to reproduce in any picture of the art and times. One of the greatest delusions of the public in regard to any notable invention. Is the belief that the world is waiting for it with open arms and an eager welcome? Exact contrary is the truth. There is not a single new art or device the world has ever enjoyed of which it can be said that it was given immediate enthusiastic reception. The way of the inventor is hard. He can sometimes raise capital to help him in working out his crude conceptions, but even then it is frequently done at a distressful cost of personal surrender. When the result is achieved, the invention makes its appeal on the score of economy, of material, or of effort, and then labor often awaits with crushing and tyrannical spirit to smash the apparatus or forbid its very use. Where both capital and labor are agreed that the object is worthy of encouragement, there is the superior indifference of the public to overcome, and the stubborn resistance of the pre-existing devices to combat. The years of hardship and struggle are thus prolonged. The chagrin of poverty and neglect too frequently embitters the inventor's scanty bread, and one great spirit after another has succumbed to the defeat beyond which lay the procrastinated triumph, so dearly earned. Even in America, where the adoption of improvements and innovations is regarded as so prompt and sure, and where the huge tours of the patent office. And the court bear witness to the ceaseless efforts of the inventor. It is impossible to deny that the sad truth that unconsciously society discourages invention rather than invites it. Possibly our national optimism, as revealed in invention, is seeking a higher good, needs some check. Possibly the leaders would travel too fast and too far on the road to perfection if conservatism did not also play its salutary part. In insisting that the procession move forward as a whole, Edison and his electric light were happily more fortunate than other men inventions in the relative cordiality of the reception given them. The merit was too obvious to remain unrecognized. Nevertheless, it was through intense hostility and opposition that the young art made its way, pushed forward by Edison's strong personality, and by his unbounded. Unwavering faith in the ultimate success of his system. It may seem strange that great effort was required to introduce a light so manifestly inconvenient, save agreeable and advantageous. But the facts are a matter of record, and today the recollection of some of the episodes brings a fierce glitter into the eye and keen indignation into the voice of the man who has come so victoriously through the door. It was not a fact at any time that the public was opposed to the idea of the electric light. On the contrary, the conditions for its acceptance had been ripening fast. 
Yes, the very vogue of the electric arc light made harder the arrival of the incandescent. As a new illuminant for the streets, the art become familiar, either as a direct substitute for the low gas lamp along the sidewalk curb, or as a noble form of moonlight raised in groups at the top of lofty towers, often a hundred and fifty feet high. Some of these lights were already in use for large indoor spaces, although the size of the unit, the daily pressure of the current, and sputtering sparks from the carbons. Made them highly objectionable for such purposes. A number of parent arc lighting companies were in existence, and a great many local companies had been called into being under franchise for commercial business, and to execute regular city contracts for the street lighting. In this manner, a great deal of capital and the energies of many prominent men in politics and business had been rallied distinctively. To support of arc lighting, under the inventive leaderships of such brilliant men as Bruce, Thompson, Weston, and Van Depo Eller, there were scores of others. The industry had made considerable progress, and the art has been firmly established. Here lurked, however, very rigorous elements of opposition. For Edison predicted from the start. The superiority of the small electric unit of light, and devoted himself exclusively to its perfection and introduction. It can be readily seen that this situation made it all the more difficult for Edison System to secure the large sums of money needed for its exploitation, and to obtain new franchises of city ordinances as a public utility. Thus, in the curious manner, the modern art of electric lighting was in a very true sense divided against itself. With intense rivalries and jealousies, which were none the less real, because they were but temporary and occurred in fact, where ultimate union of the force was inevitable, for a long period of time, the arc was dominant and superior in the lightning branch of the electric industries in all respects, whether as to investment, employees, income, and profits, or in the respect to the manufacturing side. When the Great National Electric Light Association was formed in 1885, its organizers were the captains of arc lighting, and not a single Edison Company or licensee could be found in its ranks, or dare to solicit membership. The Edison Company, soon numbering about 300, formed their own association, still maintained as a separate and useful body, and the lines were tensely drawn. In a way that made it none too easy for the Edison service to advance, or for an impartial man to remain friendly with both sides. With the growing popularity of incandescent lighting, the flexibility and safety of the system, the ease with which other electric devices for heat, power, etc., could be put indiscriminately on the same circuits with the lamps, in due course, rendered the old attitude of opposition obviously foolish and unattainable. The United States Census Office statistics of 1902 show that the income from incandescent lighting by central stations had by that time become over 52 percent of the total, while that from arc lighting was less than 29, and electric power surfaced due to the ease with which models could be introduced on incandescent circuits, brought in 15 percent more. Hence, 20 years after the first Edison station were established, the methods they Involved could be fairly credited with no less than 67 percent of all central station income in the country, and the proportion has grown ever since then. It will be readily understood that under these conditions, the modern lighting company supplies to its customers both incandescent and arc lighting, frequently from the same dynamo electric machinery as a source of current, and that the old feud as between the rival systems. Has died out. In fact, for some years past, the residents of the National Electric Light Association have been chosen almost exclusively from among the managers of the great Edison Lighting Companies in the leading cities. The other strong opposition to the incandescent light came from the gas industry. There also, the most bitter feeling was shown. The gas manager did not like arc light, but it interfered only with his street service. Which was not his largest source of income by any means. What did arouse his ire and indignation was to find this new opponent, 
the little incandescent lamp, pushing boldly into the field of interior lighting, claiming it on a great variety of grounds of superiority, and calmly ignoring the question of price because it was so much better. Newspaper records and the pages of the technic papers of the day show to what extent prejudice and passion were stirred up, and the astounding degree to which the opposition to the new light was carried. Here again was given the most convincing demonstration of the truth that such an addition to the resources of mankind always carries with it unsuspected benefits, even for its enemies. In two distinct directions, the gas art was immediately helped by Edison's work. The competition was almost salutary in the stimulus it gave to improvements in processes for making, distributing, and using gas, so that while vast economists have been affected at the gas works, the customers has had infinitely better light for less money. In the second place, the coming of the incandescent light raised the standard of illumination. In such a manner that more gas than ever was wanted in order to satisfy the popular demand for brightness and brilliancy, both indoors and on the street. The result of the operation of these two forces acting upon it wholly from without and from a rival it was desired to crush has been to increase enormously the production and use of the gas in the last twenty-five years. It is true that. The income of the central station is now over three hundred million dollars a year, and that isolated plant alighting represents also a large amount of diverted business. But just as shown, it would obviously be unfair to regard all this as a loss from the standpoint of gas. It is, in a great measure, due to new sources of income developed by electricity for itself. A retrospective survey shows that. Had the man in control of the American gaslighting art in 1880 been sufficiently far-sighted, and had they not taken a broader view of the situation, they might easily have remained dominant in the whole field of artificial lighting, by securing the ownership of the patents and devices of the new industry. Apparently, not a single step of that kind was undertaken. No problem was there a gas manager who would have agreed with Edison. In the opinion written down by him at the time in Little Notebook Number One Hundred Eighty Four, the gas problems were having conferred on them an enhanced earning capacity. It was doubtless fortunate and providential for the electric lining art that, in its state of immature development, it did not fall into hands of men who were opposed to its growth, and would not have sought its technical perfection. It was allowed to carve out its own career. And thus escape the fate that is supposed to have attended other great inventions, of being bought up merely for purposes of suppression. There is a vague popular notion that this happens to the public lords, but the truth is that no discovery of any real value is ever entirely lost. It may be retarded, but that is all. In the case of the gas companies and the incandescent light. Many of them, to whom he was in the early days as great an irritant as a rat flat to a bow, emulated the performance of that animal and spent a great deal of money and energy in belowing and throwing up dirt in the effort to destroy the hated enemy. This was not long, nor universally the spirit shown. And today, in hundreds of cities, the electric and gas problems are united under the one management, which does not find it. Impossible to push in a friendly and progressive way the use of both illuminants. The most conspicuous example of this identity of interest is given in New York itself. So much for the early opposition of which there were plenty, but it may be questioned whether inertia is not equally to be dreaded with active ill will. Nothing is more difficult in the world than to get a good many hundreds of thousands or millions of people to do something they have never done before. A very real difficulty in the introduction of a lamp and lighting system by Edison lay in the absolute ignorance of the public at large, not only as to its merits but as to the very appearance of the light. Some few thousand people had gone out to Menlo Park, and had there seen the lamps in operation at the laboratory. Or on the hillsides, but they were an insignificant proportion of the inhabitants of the United States. Of course, a great many accounts were written and read, but while general interest was aroused, it was necessarily apathetic. 
a newspaper description of a magazine article may be admirably complete in itself, with illustrations. But until some personal experience is had of the thing described, it does not convey a perfect mental picture. Nor can it always make the desire active and insistent. Generally, people wait to have the new thing brought to them, and hence, as in the case of the Edison light, an educational campaign of a practical nature is a fundamental condition of success. After a serious difficulty confronting Edison and his associates was that nowhere in the world would there to be purchased any of the appliances necessary for the use of lighting system. Edison has resolved from the very first that the initial central station, emboldening his various ideas, should be installed in New York City, where he could superintend the installation personally, and then watch the operation. Plans to that end were now rapidly maturing, but there will be needed, among many other things, every one of them new and novel: dynamos, switchboards, regulators, pressure and current indicators. Fixture in great variety, incandescent lamp, meters, sockets, small switches, underground conductors, junction boxes, service boxes, manhole boxes, connectors, and even specially made wire. Now, not one of these materials things were in existence. Not any outsider was sufficiently informed about such devices to make them in order, except perhaps the special wire. Edison therefore started the first of all a lamp factory. In one of the buildings in Menlo Park, equipped it with novel machinery and apparatus, and began to instruct men, boys and girls, as they could be enlisted in the absolutely new art, putting Mr. Upton in charge. With regard to the condition attendant upon the manufacture of the lens, Edison says, "When we first started the electric light, we had had a factory for manufacturing lens." As the Edison Light Company did not seem disposed to go into manufacturing, we started a small lamp factory in Menlo Park, with what money I could raise from my other inventions or royalties, and some assistance. The lamps at that time were costing about one point two five dollars each to make, so I said to the company, "If you will give me a contract during the life of the patents, I will make all the lamps required by the company and deliver them for forty cents." The company jumped at the chance of this offer, and a contract was drawn up. We then bought at a receiver sale at Harrison, New Jersey, a very large brick factory building which had been used as an oil cloth works. We got it at a great bargain, and only paid a small sum down, and the ballast and water gauge. We moved the lamp works from Menlo Park to Harrison. The first year, lamps cost us about one point one zero dollars each. We sold them for forty cents, but there were only about twenty or thirty thousands of them. The next year, they cost us about seventy cents, and we sold them for forty cents. There were a good many, and we lost more money the second year than in the first. A third year, I succeeded in getting our machinery and in changing processes until it got down so that it cost somewhere around fifty cents. I still sold them for forty cents and lost more money. That year than any other because the sales were increasingly rapidly. The fourth year I got it down to thirty-seven cents and I made all the money up in one year that I had lost previously. I finally got it down to twenty-two cents and sold them for forty cents, and they were made by the million. Whereupon the Wall Street people thought it was a very lucrative business, so they concluded that they would like to have it and bought us out. One of the incidents which caused a very great cheapening was that, when we started, one of the important processes had to be done by experts. This was the selling of the part carrying the filament into the globe, which was rather a delicate operation in those days, and required several months of training before anyone could sell a fair number of part parts in a day. When we got to the point where we employed eighty of these experts, they formed a union. And knowing it was impossible to manufacture lamps without them, they become very insolent. One instance was that the son of one of these experts was employed in the office, and when he was told to do anything, would not do it, and or would give an insolent reply. He was discharged. Whereupon the union notified us that unless the boy was taken back, the whole body would go out. It got so bad that the manager came to me and said. He could not stand 
any longer. Something had got to be done. They were not only more surly, they were diminishing the output, and it became impossible to manage the works. He got me enthused on the subject, so I started in to see if it were not possible to do that operation by machinery. After feeling around for some days, I got a clue how to do it. I then put men on it I could trust, and made the preliminary machinery. It seemed to work pretty well. I then made another machine which did the work nicely, and then made the third machine, and would bring in yard men, ordinary labor laborers, etc. And when I could get these men to put the parts together, as well as the trained experts, in an hour, I considered the machine complete. I then went secretly to work and made thirty of the machines. Up in the toft loft of the factory, we stored these machines. And at night we put up the benches and got everything all ready. Then we discharged the office boy. Then the union went out. He has been out ever since. When we formed the works at Harrison, we divided the interest into one hundred shares or parts at one hundred dollars par. One of the boys were hard up at the time and sold two shares to Bob Cutting. Up to that time, we had never paid anything, but we got around to the point where the board declared. A dividend every Saturday night. We had never declared a dividend when Cutting bought his shares, and after getting his dividends for three weeks in succession, I called up on the telephone and wanted to know what kind of a concern this was that paid a weekly dividend. The work sold for one million and eighty-five thousand dollars. Incidentally, it may be noted, as illustrative of the problem brought to Edison, that while he had the factory at Harrison. An importing a Chinese trader went to him and wanted a dynamo to be run by hand power. The importer explained that in China human labor was cheaper than steam power. Edison devised a machine to answer the purpose and put long spokes on it, fitted it up, and shipped it to China. He has not, however, heard of it since. For making the dynamos, Edison secured, as noted in the preceding chapter, the Roach Iron Works on. Go Work Street, New York, and this was also equipped. A building was rented on Washington Street, where machinery tours were put in specially designed for making the underground tube conductor and the various paraphernalia. And the faithful John Cruyasi was given charge of that branch of production. To Sigmund Bergman, who had worked previously with Edison on telephone apparatus and phonographs. And was already making Edison specialities in a small way, in a loft on Wooster Street, New York, was assigned the task of constructing sockets, fixtures, meters, safety fuses, and numerous other details. Thus, broadly, the manufacturing end of the problem of introduction was cleared off. In the early part of 1881, the Edison Electric Light Company leased the old Bishaw Mansion at 65 Fifth Avenue. Close to Fording Street, for its headquarters and showrooms, this was one of the finest homes in the city of that period, and its acquisition was a premonitory sign of the surrender of the famous residential avenue to commerce. The company needed not only offices but even more, such as an interior, as would display to advantage the new light in everyday use, and this house. With its liberal lines, spacious halls, lofty salons, white parlors, and graceful winding stairway, was ideal for the purpose. In fact, in undergoing this violent change, it did not cease to be a home in the real sense. For to this day, many an Edison veteran's house is quickened by some chance reference to sixty-five, where the through many years the work of development by a loyal and devoted band of workers was centered. Here. Addison and a few of his assistants from Menlo Park installed immediately in the basement a small generating plant, at first with a gas engine, which was not successful, and then with a Hampson high-speed engine and boiler, constituted a complete isolated plant. The building was wired from top to bottom, and equipped with all the appliances of the art. The experience with the little gas engine was rather startling. At an early period of sixty-five, we decided, says Edison, to light it up with the Edison system, and put a gas engine in the cellar, using city gas. 
One day it was not going very well, and I went down to the man in charge and got exploring around. Finally, I opened the pedestal, a storehouse for tourists, etc. We had an open lamp, and we, when we opened the pedestal, it blew the doors off and blew out the windows and knocked me down and the other man. For the next four or five years, sixty-five was a veritable beehive, day and night. The routine was very much the same as that at the laboratory, in its other necklet of the clock. The evenings were not only devoted to the continuance of the regular business, but the house were thrown open to the public until late at night, never closing before ten o'clock, so as to give everybody who wished an opportunity to see that great novelty of the time, the incandescent light, whose fame had meanwhile been spreading all over the globe. The first year, 1881, was naturally that which witnessed the greatest rush of visitors, and the building hardly ever closed its doors till midnight. During the day business was carried on on the great stress, and Mr. Ingzow has described how Edison was to be found there trying to lead the life of men of affairs in the conventional garb of polite society, instead of pursuing inventions and researches in his laboratory. But the disagreeable odor could not be dodged. After the experience, Edison could never again be tempted to quit his laboratory and work for any length of time. But in this instance, there were some advantages attached to the sacrifice, for the crowds of lying hunters and people seeking business arrangements would not only have gone out to Menlo Park, while, on the other hand, the great plans for lighting New York demanded very close personal attention on the sport. As he was, not only Edison but all the company's directors, officers, and employees were kept busy exhibiting and explaining light. To the public of that day, when the highest known form of the house illuminant was gas, the incandescent lamp with its ability to burn in any position, its lack of heat so that you can put your hand on the brilliant glass globe, the absence of any vitiating effect of, on the atmosphere, the obvious safety from fire, the curious fact that you need in no match just to light it, and that it was under absolute control from a distance. These and many other features came as a distinct revelation and marvel, while promising so much addition comfort, convenience, and beauty in the house, that inspection was almost invariably followed by request for installation. The camaraderie that existed at this time was very democratic, for all were workers in a common cause, all were enthusiastic believers in the doctrine they proclaimed, and hoped to profit by the opening up of the new art. Often at night, in the small hours, all would adjourn for refreshments to a famous resort nearby, and to discuss the events of the today and tomorrow, full of instant excitement. The easy relationship at the time is neatly sketched by Edison, in humorous complaint as to his inability to keep his own secrets. When at sixty-five, I used to have in my desk a box of secrets. I would go to the box four or five times a day to get a secret, but after it got circulated about the building, everybody would come to get my cigars, so the box would only last about a day and a half. I was telling a gentleman one day that I could not keep a secret. Even if I locked them up in my desk, they would break it open. He suggested to me that he had a friend over on 8th Avenue who made a superior grade of cigars, and who would show them a trick. He said that, he would have some of them made up with hair and old paper, and I could put them in without a word and see the result. I thought no more about the matter. He came in two or three months after and said, How did that secret business work? I didn't remember anything about it, and coming to investigate, it appeared that the box of secrets had been delivered and had been put in my desk, and I had smoked them all. I was too busy on other things to denotice. It was not uncommon sight to see in the parlors in the evening of John Pierre Morgan, Novin Brain, Grosvenor P. Laurie, Henry Villa, Robert L. Cutton, Edward D. Adams, J. Hood Wright, E. G. Fabry, Armand Galloway, and other men prominent in the city life, many of them stockholders and directors, all interested in doing this educational work. Thousands of persons thus came, bankers, brokers, lawyers, editors, and reporters, prominent businessmen, electricians, insurance experts, under whose researching and intelligent inquiries the fact was elicited, and general admiration was soon won for the system, which in advance had solved so many new problems. Addison himself, in universal request, 
and the subject of much adulation, but altogether too busy and modest to be spoiled by it. Once in a while he felt in his duty to go over the ground with scientific visitors, many of whom were foreign abroad, and discuss questions which were not simply those of technique, but related to newer phenomena, such as the action of carbon, the nature and effect of high vacuum, the principles of electrical subdivision, the value of insulation, and many others which, unfortunate to say, remain as esoteric now as they were then, even fruitful themes of controversy. Speaking of those days of nights, Addison says, Years ago, one of the great violinists was Ramoni. After his performances went, were over, he used to come down to sixty-five and talk economics, philosophy, moral science, and everything else. He was highly educated and had a great mental capacity. He would talk with me, but I never asked him to bring his violin. One night, he came with his violin, about twelve o'clock. I had a library at the top of the house, and Ramney came up there. He was in a genuine humor, and played the violin for me for about two hours, two thousand dollars worth. The front door were closed, and he walked up and down the room as he played. After that, every time he came to New York, he used to call at sixty-five late at night with his violin. If we were not there, he would come down to the slums on Gower Street, and would play for an hour or two and talk philosophy. I would talk for the benefit of his music. Henry Dixie, then at the height of his Adonis popularity, would come in, in those days, after theater hours, and would entertain us with stories. 1882 to 1884. Another visitor who would used to give us a good deal of amusement and pleasure was Captain Shaw, the head of the London Fire Brigade. He was good company. He would go out among the fire ladies and have a great time. One time, Robert Lincoln, Anson Stager, of the Western Union, interested in the electric light, came on to make some arrangement with Major Eaton, president of the Anson Electric Light Company. They came to 65 in the afternoon, and Lincoln commenced telling stories, like his father. They told stories all the afternoon, and that night they left for Chicago. When they got to Cleverland, it dawned upon them that they had not done any business, so they had to come back on the next train to New York and transact it. They were interested in the Chicago Edison Company, now one of the largest of the systems in the world. Speaking of telling stories, I once got telling a man stories at the Harrison Land factory, in the yard as he was leaving. It was winter, and he was all in furs. I had nothing on to protect me against the cold. I told him one story after the other, six of all. Then I got pleurisy and had to be shipped to Florida for cure. The organization of the Edison Electric Light Company went back to 1868, but up to the time of leasing 65 Fifth Avenue, I had not been engaged in actual business. He had merely enjoyed the delights of anxious anticipation and the perilous pleasure of backing Edison's experiments. Now active exploitation was required. Dr. Norring Green, the well-known president of the Western Union Telegraph Company, was president also of the Edison Company, but the present nature of his regular duties left him no leisure for such close responsible management as was now required. Early in 1881, Mr. Gross Venner, P. Lorry, after consultation with Mr. Edison, prevailed upon Major S. B. Eaton, the leading member of a very prominent law firm in New York, to accept the position of vice president and general manager of the company, in which, as also in some of the subsidiary Edison companies, and as president, he continued actively and energetically for nearly four years, a critical formative period in which the solidity of the foundation laid is attested by the magnitude and splendor of the superstructure. The fact that Addison conferred at this point with Mr. Lowry should perhaps be explained in justice to the distinguished lawyer, who for so many years was the close friend of the inventor and the chief counsel in all the tremendous litigation that followed the effort to enforce and validate Addison patents. As in Ad England, Mr. Addison was fortunate in securing the legal assistance of Sir Richard Webster, afterward Lord Chief Justice of England, so in America, it counted greatly in his favor to enjoy the advocacy of such men as Lorry. Prominent among the famous leaders of the New York Bar, born in Massachusetts, 
Mr. Lorry, in his earlier days of straitened circumstances, was accustomed to defray some portion of his educational expenses by teaching music in Berkshire villages, and by a curious coincidence, one of his pupils, F. L. Pope, later Addison partner for a time, Lorry went west to bleeding Kansas with the first governor reader and both were active participants in the exciting scenes of the Free State War until driven away in 1856 by many other free soilers by the acts of the broader roughing legislature. Returning east, Miss Lowry took up practice in New York, soon becoming eminent in his profession, and upon the accession of William Arden to the presidency of the Western Union Telegraph Company in 1866, he was appointed its general counsel, the duties of which post he discharged for fifteen years. One of the great cases in which he thus took a leading and distinguished art was that of the quadruplex telegraph, and later he acted as a legal adviser to Henry Villard in his numerous grandiose enterprises. Lowry thus came to know Edison, to conceive an intense admiration for him, and to believe in his ability at the time when others could not detect the fire of genius smothering beneath the modest material of a gaunt young operator slowly finding himself. It will be seen that Mr. Lorry was in a peculiarly advantageous position to make his convictions about Addison felt, so that it was he and his friends who rallied quickly to the new barn of discovery and lent to the inventor the aid that came as a critical period. In this connection, it may be well to quote an article with, that appeared at the time of Mr. Lorry's death in 1893. One of the most important services which Mr. Lorry has ever performed was in furnishing and procuring the necessary financial backing for Thompson A. Addison and bringing out and perfecting his system of incandescent lightning. With characteristic pertinacity, Mr. Lorry stood by the inventor through thick and thin, in spite of doubt, discouragement, and ridicule, until at last success crowned his efforts and all the litigation which had resulted from the widespread infringements of Addison patents, Mr. Lorry has ever borne the burden and heat of the day, and perhaps in no other field has he so personally distinguished himself as in the successful advocacy of the claims of Addison to the invention of the incandescent lamp and everything here around pertaining. This was the man of whom Edison had necessarily to make confident an adviser, and who supplied other things beside the legal direction and financial alliance, by his knowledge of the world and affairs. There were many vital things to be done, in the exploitation of the system, that Edison simply could not and would not do. But Laura's several fair readily wit and humor, chivalry and devotion, graceful eloquence, and admirable equipoise of judgment were all the qualities that the occasion demanded and that met the exigences. We are indebted to Mr. Ingsell for a graphic sketch of Addison at this period and of the conditions under which work was done and progress was made. I do not think I had any understanding with Addison when I first went with him. As to my duties, I did whatever he told me and looked after all kinds of fears, from buying his clothes to financing his business. I used to open the correspondence and answer it all, sometimes signing Adam's name with my initial and sometimes signing my own name. If the letter of course were pursued, I was addressing a stranger. I was signing as Addison's private secretary. I had his power of attorney and signed his checks. It was seldom that Addison signed a letter or check at that time. If he wanted personally to send a communication to anybody, if it was one of his close associates, it would probably be a pencil Memo signed Edison. It was a shorthand writer. The seldom took down from Edison dictation, and as it was one on some technical sub subject that I did not understand, I would go over the correspondence with Edison, sometimes making the marginal note in shorthand, and sometimes Edison would make his own notes on letters, and I would be expected to clear up the correspondence with Edison according to comments as a guide as to the character of answer to make. It was a very common thing for Addison to write the words yes or no, and this would be all I had on which to base my answer. Addison marginalized documents extensively. He had a wonderful ability in pointing out the weak points of agreement, a balance sheet, all the while protesting he was no lawyer or accountant, and his vows were expressed in a very few words, but in characteristic and emphatic manner. The first few months I was with Addison, he spent most of the time in the office at 35 Fifth Avenue. 
Then there was a great deal of trouble with the life of Lamps there, and he disappeared from the office and spent his time largely among the park. At another time there was a great deal of trouble with some of the details in construction of dynamos, and had to spend a lot of time at Gower Street, which had been rapidly equipped with the idea of turning out high polar dynamo electric machines, direct connected to the engine, the first of which went to Paris and London, while the next were installed in the old Pearl Street station of Edison Electric Illuminating Company of New York, just south of Fulton Street, and the west side of the street. Edison devoted a great deal of his time to the engineering work in connection with the laying out of the first incandescent electric lighting system in New York. Apparently, at that time, between the end of 1881 and spring of 1882, the most serious work was the manufacture installation of underground conducts in this territory. These conductors were manufactured by Electric Tube Company, which Edison controlled in a shop at 65 Washington Street, run by John Cruzzi. Half-run copper conductors were used. Kept in place relatively to each other, and in the tube, first of all by a heavy piece of cardboard, and later on by a rope, and then put in a twenty-foot iron pipe, and a combination of asphaltum and linseed oil was forced into the pipe for insulation. I remember as a coincidence that the building was only twenty feet wide. These lengths of conductors were twenty feet six inches long, as the half-round coppers extended to three inches beyond the drag ends of the length of the pipe. And in one of the operations we used to take the length of tubing out of the window, in order to turn it around, I was elected secretary of the electric tube company, and was expected to look after its finances. And it was in this position that my long intimacy with John Cruzzi started. At this juncture, a large part of the correspondence referred very naturally to electric lighting, emboldening requests for all kinds of information, catalogues, prices, terms, etc., and all these letters were turned over to the lighting company by Edison for attention. The company was soon swamped with proposition for sale of territorial rights and with other negotiations, and some of these were accompanied by the offer of very large sums of money. It was the beginning of the electric light forward, which soon rose to sensational heights. Had the company accepted this cash offer from the rice localities, it could have gathered several millions of dollars at once in strategy. But this was not at all in accord with Mr. Edison's idea, which was to prove by actual experience the commercial value of the system, and then to license a central station commerce in large cities and towns. The apparent company taking the percent. Tage of their capital for the license under the Edison patents, and contracting also for the supply of apparatus, lamps, etc. This left the remainder of the country open for the cash sale of plants wherever requested. His counsels prevailed, and the wisdom of the policy adopted was seen in the swift establishment of Edison companies in centers of population both great and small, whose business were has ever been a constant and growing source of income for the parent manufacturing interest. From first to last, Edison has been an exponent and advocate of the central station idea of distribution, now so familiar to the public mind, but still very far from being carried out to its logical conclusions. In this instance, demands for isolated plants for lighting factories, mills, mines, hotels, etc., began to pour in, and something had to be done with them. This was a class of plant which the inquirers desired to purchase outright and offer themselves. Usually, because of remoteness for any possible source of general supply for Concord, it had not been Edison's intention to cater to this class of customer until his broad central station plan had been worked out, and he has also discouraged this isolated plant within the limits of urban circuits. But these demands were so insistent it could not be denied, and it was deemed desirable to comply with it at once, especially as it was seen that the steady cure. For supplies and renewers would come benefit the new Edison manufacturing plants. After a very short trial, it was found necessary to create a separate organization for this branch of the industry, leaving the Edison Electric Light Company to continue under the original plan of operation as a parent, patent holding and licensing company. Accordingly, a new and distinct Corporation was formed, called the Edison Company for Isolated Lightning, to which was issued a special license to sell and operate plants of a self-contained character. As a matter of fact, 
such work began in advance of almost every other kind a small plant using the paper carbon filament lamps were furnished by edison at the earnest solicitation of mr henry villard for the steamship columbia in 1879 and it is amusing to know that mr upton carried the lamps himself to the ship very tenderly and jealously like fresh eggs a market garden basket the installation was almost successful another pioneer plant was that equipped and started in january eighteen eighty one for hints and ketchum a new firm of lithographers and color painters who had previously been able to work only by day owing to the difficulties in coloring printing by artificial light a year later they said it is best substitute for daylight we have ever known and almost as cheap mr edison himself described various instance in which the demands for isolated plants had to be met one night at sixty five he says james gordon bennett came in we were very anxious to get into a printing establishment i had caused a printer's composing case to be set up with the idea that if we could get editors and publishers in to see it we should show them the advantages of the electric light so ultimately mr bennett came and after seeing the whole operation of everything he ordered mr hole and general manager of the herald to light the newspaper office at up at once with electricity another incident of the same kind deals the introduction of the light for purely social purposes while at sixty fifth avenue remarked mr edison i got to know christine hatter then the largest decorator of the united states he was a highly electoral man and i loved to talk to him he was always railing against the rich people for whom he did work for their poor taste one day mr w h vanderbilt who came to sixty five saw the light and decided that he would have his new house lighted with it this was one of the big box houses on upper fifth avenue he put the whole matter in the hands of his son-in-law mr h mike tombley who was then in charge of the telephone department of the western union tombley closed a contract with the for a plant mr herder was doing the decoration and it was extraordinarily fine after a while we got the engines and boilers and wires all done and the lights in position before the house was quite finished and thought we could have an exhibit for of the light about eight o'clock in the evening we lit it up and it was very good mr vanderbreed and his wife and some of his daughters came in and were there a few minutes when a fire occurred the large picture gallery was in lined with silk cloth interwoven with fine metallic thread in some manner two wires had got crossed with this tinsel which became red hot and then the whole mass was soon afire and knew what was the matter and ordered them to run down and shut off it had not burst into flame and died out immediately mr vanderbilt became hysterical and wanted to know where he came from we told her we had the plant in the cellar and then she learned we had a boiler there she said she would not occupy the house she would not leave over a boiler we had to take the whole installation out the houses afterward went on to the new york edison system the art was however very crude and raw and as there were no artisans in existence as mechanics or electricians who had had any knowledge of the practice there was inconceivable difficulty in getting such isolated plants installed as well as wiring the buildings in the district to be covered by the first central station new york a night stool was therefore founded at fifth avenue and was put in charge of mr e h johnson fresh from his success in england the most available men for the purpose were of course those who had been accustomed to wiring for the simple electrical system then the vulgar telephones district messengers calls bulger alarms house annunciators etc and a number of these wire men were engaged and instructed patiently in the rudiments of the new arts by means of a blackboard and hour lessons students from the technical schools and colleges were also eager recruits for here was something that promised a career and one that was especially luring to young youth because of its novelty these beginners were also instructed in general engineering problems under the guidance of mr c l clark who was brought in from the mellow park laboratory to assume charge of the engineering part of the commerce affairs many of these pioneer students and workmen became afterward large and successful contractors or have held positions of distinction as managers and superintendents of central stations possibly the electrical industry may not now attract as much adventurous genius as it did then 
for automobiles, aeronautics, and other new arts had come to the front in a quarter of a century to enlist in the enthusiasm of a young generation a mercury spirit. But it is certain that at the period of which we write, Addison himself still under thirty-five, was the centre of an extraordinary group of men, full of ever resting and aspiring talent to which he gave glorious opportunity. A very novel literary feature of the work ha was the issuance of a bulletin devoted entirely to the Addison Lightning propaganda. Nowadays, the house organ, as it is called, has become a very hackneyed feature of industrial development, confusing in its variety and volume, and a somewhat doubtful adjunct to a highly perfected, widely circulating periodic panic press. But at that time, 1882, the bulletin of the Edison Electric Light Company, published in ordinary 12 ammo form, was distinctly new in advertising and possibly unique. As it is difficult to find anything that compared with it, the bulletin was carried on for some years, until its necessary was removed by development of other opportunities for reaching the public, and its pages serve now as a vivid and lively picture of the period to which its record applies. The first issue of January 12, 1882, was only four pages, but it dealt with the question of insurance, plants at San Diego, Chile, and Rio de Janeiro, and the European Company with 3,500,000 francs described. The works in Paris, London, Strasbourg, and Moscow, the laying of over six miles of street mains in New York, a patent decision in favor of Edison, and the size of a safety catch wire. By April of 1882, the bulletin had attained the respectable size of 16 pages, and in December, it was a partly magazine for 48. Every item it bears testimony to the rapid progress being made, and by the end of 1882, it is seen that no fewer than 153 isolated Edison plants had been started in the United States alone, with a capacity of 29,000 and 192 lands. Moreover, the New York Central Station had gone into operation starting at 3 p.m. on September 4th, and at the close of 1882, there was lighting 225 houses wide for about 5,000 lands. This apple good story will be told in next chapter. The most interesting are the bulletin notes from the England, especially in regard to the brilliant exhibition given by Mr. E. H. Johnson at the Crystal Palace at Sydenham visited by the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh, twice by the Dukes of Westminster and Sutherland, by three hundred members of the Gas Institute, and by a number of delegation from cities, boroughs, etc. Describing this before the Royal Society of Arts, Sir W. H. Pierce, F.R.S., remarked, Many unkind things have been said of Mr. Edison and his promises. Perhaps no one has been severer in this direction than myself. It is some gratification for me to announce my belief that he has at last solved the problem he set himself to solve, and to be able to describe the, to the society the way in which he has solved it. Before the exhibition closed, it was visited by the Prince and Princess of Wales, now the deceased Edward VII, and the Dowage Queen Alexandra, and the Princesses received from Mr. Johnson as a souvenir a tiny electric chandelier fashioned like a banquet of fern leaves and flowers, the buds being some of the first miniature incandescent lamps ever made. The first item in the first bulletin board deal with the fire question, and all through the successive issues runs a series of significant items on the same subject. Many of them are aimed at gas, and there are several green summaries of death and fires due to gas leakers or exploitation. A tendency existed at the time to assume that electricity was altogether safe, while its opponents, predicting their attacks on arc lighting casualties, insisted that it was most dangerous. Edison problem educating the public was rather difficult, for while his low pressure, direct current system has always been absolutely without danger to life, there has also been the undeniable fact that escaping electricity might cause a fire just as a leaky water pipe can flood a house. The important question had arisen, therefore, of satisfying the fire underwriters as to the safety of their system. He had foreseen that there would be an absolute necessity for special devices to prevent fires from occurring by reason of any excessive current flowing in any circuits, 
and several of his earliest detailed lightning inventions deal with this subject. The insurance underwriters of New York and other parts of the country give a great deal of time and study to the question through their most expert representatives, with the aid of Edison and his associates. Other electric light companies are cooperating, and the knowledge of this gained was embodied in insurance rules to govern wiring for electric lightning. Formulated during the later part of 1881, adopted by the New York Board of Fire Underwriters, January 12, 1882, and subsequently endorsed by the other boards in the various insurance districts. Under temporary rulings, however, a vast amount of work had already been done, but it was obviously that the industry grew there with the less and less possibility of supervision, except though through such. Regulations insisting upon the use of the best devices and methods. Indeed, the direct superintendence soon became unnecessary, owing to the increasing knowledge and greater skill acquired by the installing staff. And this system of education was notably improved by the many written by Mr. Adams himself. Copies of this procure are as scarce today as first folio Shakespeare's, and common prices equal to those of the other American first editions. The little book is the only known incursion of its author into literature. If we accept the brief articles he has written for technical papers and for the magazines, it contains what was at once a full, elaborate, and terse explanation of a complete isolated plant, with diagrams of various methods of connection and operation, and a carefully detailed description of every individual part, its function, its characteristics. The remarkable success of those early years was indeed only achieved by following up with the Chinese exactness the minute and intimate methods insisted upon by Edison as to the use of the power and devices employed. It was a curious example of establishing standard practice while changing with kaleidoscopic rapidity all the elements involved. He was true to idea as to the polar star, but was incessantly making improvements with. In every direction, with an iron class and that has often seemed ruthless and brutal, he did not hesitate to sacrifice older devices the moment a new one came in sight that embodied real advance in securing effective results. The process is heroic but costly. Nobody ever had a bigger trap heap than Edison, but who dare proclaim the process intrinsically wasteful if the losses occur in the initial stages, and economies in all the later ones? With Edison in this introduction of his lighting system, the method was ruthless but not reckless. At an early stage of commercial development, a standardizing committee was formed, consisting of the heads of all the departments, and to this body was instructed in the task of testing and criticizing all existing and proposed devices, as well as of considering the suggestions and complaints of workmen offered from time to time. This procedure was fruitful in two principal results: the education of the whole executive force in the technical details of the system, and a constant improvement in the quality of the Edison installations. Both contributed to the rapid growth of the industry. For many years, Gower Street played an important part in Edison affairs, being the center of all its manufacture of heavy machinery. But it was not in a desirable neighborhood, and owing to the rapid growth of the business, soon became disadvantageous for other reasons. Addison tells of his frequent visits to the shops at night, with the escort of Jim Russell, a well-known detective who knew all the denizens of the places. We used to go out at night, a little low place, an old lighthouse, eight feet wide and twenty feet long, where we got a lunch at two or three o'clock in the morning. It was the toughest kind of restaurant ever seen. For the clam chowder, they used the same four claims during the whole season, and the van average number of flies per pie was seven. That was by actual count. As to the shops and the locality, the street was lined with rather old buildings and poor tenements. We had no much frontage. As our business increased enormously, our quarters became too small. So we saw the district tenant leader and asked him. We could now store castings and other things on the sidewalk. He gave us permission, told us to go ahead, and he would see it was all right. The only thing he required for this was that when the man was sent with a note from him asking us for to give him a job, he has to be put on. 
who had a hand labor foreman, Big Jane, a very powerful Irishman, who could lift above half a ton. When one of the Tammy aspirants appeared, he was told to go right to work at one point five dollars per day. The next day he was told to off to lift a certain piece, and if the man could not lift, he was discharged. That made the Tammy men all safe. Jim could pick the piece up easily; the other men could not, and so we let him out. Finally, the Tammy leader caught a hot as we were running a big engine lift out on the sidewalk, and he was afraid that we were carrying it a little too far. The lifts were worked right out in the street and bounded through the windows for the shop. At last, it became necessary to move from Gowork Street. And Mr. Edison gives a very interesting account of the incident in connection with the transfer of the plant to Schenectady, New York. After our works at Gower Street go too small, we had labor troubles also. It seems I had rather a socialistic strain in me, and I raised the pay of the workmen twenty-five cents an hour above the prevailing rates of wages. Whereupon Ho and Company, our new neighbors, complained at our doing this. I said I thought it was all right. But the men, having got a little more wages, thought they would try coercion and get a little more, as we were considered soft marks. Whereupon this struck at that time that was critical. However, we were short of money for payrolls, and we concluded it might not be so bad after all, and it would give us a couple of weeks to catch up. So when the workmen went out, they appointed a committee to meet us. But for two weeks they could not find us, so became somewhat more anxious than we were. Finally, they said they would like to go back. We said all right, and back they went. It was quite a novelty to the men not to be able to find us when they wanted to, and they didn't relish it at all. What with these troubles and lack of room, we decided to find a factory elsewhere, and decided to try the locomotive works at Schenectady. It seems that the people there had had a falling out among themselves, and one of the directors had started opposition works, but. Before he had completed all the buildings and putting machinery, some compromise was made, and the works were for sale. We bought them very reasonably and moved everything there. These works were owned by me and my assistant until sold to Edison General Electric Company. At one time, we employed several thousand men, and since then, the work has been greatly expanded. At these new works, our orders were fair, far in excess of our capital to handle the business. And both Mr. Ingsoll and I were afraid we might get into trouble for lack of money. Mr. Ingsoll was then my business manager, running the whole thing, and therefore, when Mr. Henry Villard and his syndicate offered to buy us out, we concluded it was better to be sure than to be sorry. So we sold out for a large sum. Villard was a very aggressive man with big ideas, so I could never quite understand him. He had no sense of humor. I remember one time we were going up to the Hudson River boat in to inspect the works, and with us was Mr. Henderson, our chief engineer, who was certainly the best recounter of funny stories I ever knew. We sat at the tail end of the boat, and he started in to tell funny stories. Villard could not see a single point and scarcely laugh at all, and Henderson became so disconcerted he had to give it up. It was the same way with gold. In the early telegraph days, I remember going with him to see Mackay, and the impecunious country editor. It was very funny, full of amusing, absurd situations, but I never smiled once. The formation of the Edison General Electric Company involved the consolidation of the immediate Edison manufacturing interest in electric light and power, with a capitalization of twelve million dollars. Now a relatively modest sum, but in those days the amount was large, and the combination caused a great deal of new paper comment as to such a coinage of brain power. Next step came with the creation of the Great General Electric Company of today, a combination of the Edison, Thomson, Hudson, and Bruch Lightning interest in the manufacture, which to this day maintains the ever-glowing plants at Harrison Lane, Schenectady. And their employees from twenty to twenty-five thousand people. End of chapter fifteen. Recording by Nelly, Xi'an, China.